Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast and audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved and long forgotten murders, all set within and beyond the West End. Today's episode is about Harry Tuffney. Through his eyes, he saw himself as a loyal and loving man who always fought to live a good life. But when his perfect little dream went awry, Harry would do the unthinkable. Murder Mile is researched using authentic sources. It contains moments of satire, shock and grisly details. And as a dramatisation of the real events, it may also feature loud and realistic sounds. So that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 146, Harry Tufney, The Abandoned Man. Today, I'm standing on Star Street in Paddington, W2. Two streets from four very different killers. There's the solo strangling of the sad-faced killer on Sussex Gardens. The necrophile Reg Christie preying on Kathleen Maloney in Prade Street. The sadistic blackout ripper casually smoking after his failed attack on Catherine Mulcahy in Southwick Street. And then there was Frozen Jim. Coming soon to Murder Mile. Just shy of Paddington Station, Star Street is one of a series of identical residential streets, packed full of late 19th century three-storey terraces, which was formerly a slum. But with white stucco on the ground floor, brown brick above, and wrapped with black wrought iron railings, they've brushed up right nice. The problem is, With each street identical and every house indistinguishable, it's hard to tell them apart except for a tiny detail. Like a lamp, a flower box, a garishly coloured door, a mat with an oh-so-witty slogan like welcome, only misspelt so it says Wecklam. You don't have to be mad here but it helps, suggesting that the owner is a personality on legs when in fact he's just a turd in a suit. And the ever funny, beware of the wife. Not the dog, the wife. Implying that she's vicious, has rabies, and spends half the day licking her genitals. Today it's a home. But back in the 1930s, 75 Star Street was Elizabeth Warren's lodging house. In the front second floor rooms lived Harry, a mechanic, and Kitty, a waitress. A pleasant couple in their late thirties who had recently got engaged and were looking forward to spending the rest of their lives together. This was where their love affair had begun and sadly it was also where it would end. As it was here on the night of Friday the 29th of June, 1934, that gripped with a lifelong fear of abandonment, Harry Tuffney would ensure that he and his beloved Kitty would never be apart. Into the wee small hours of the night, Dressed in just pyjamas and a nightdress, Harry and Kitty were sat on Harry's bed. Being in an age where unmarried couples didn't dare share a bed, let alone have sex, the couple had single rooms with single beds connected by an adjoining door. Having sat sipping whiskey and ale from two tumblers, the lovesick twosome who had only been an item for barely a year, 
so their feelings were still as box fresh as it was the day that they met, had talked of their past and their future, of one together and one apart. Through Harry's eyes, there were no cries nor noises that night, only tears. No one in that fully occupied lodging house heard a single sound as the unthinkable happened. With Kitty tucked up in her own little bed, snuggled under the softness of her own sheets, Harry kissed his beloved's cheek. Goodbye, my sweet. As her last ever breath left her slowly cooling body. Kitty was gone. Harry was broken. So with no reason left to live, Harry used his last moments alive to write two letters. One to the police explaining the situation and one to his family, apologizing for what he had done and was yet to do. Dear Mum and all, my darling passed away at 3 a.m. It was instantaneous. She did not suffer at all, never murmured, We had quite a long chat together. We had a bottle of ale and a small bottle of whiskey. A parting drink from this world to the next. She said she did not care which way things went. Little did she know how near both our times were. Goodbye all, Harry. With handwritten love letters strewn about the floor, and their last drink still wetted with her lipstick, Harry laid upon the carpet. Placing down two cushions for his head, he laid flat and opened up the gas taps. Through Harry's eyes, death was the only option. Her death, his death, together. Born Edith Kathleen Longshaw in 1896, making her 38 years old when she died, Kitty was never a fan of being called Edith. Instead, she preferred Kathleen, Kitty or Cat. Raised in the peaceful village of Shipton under Witchwood in Oxfordshire, this small ancient parish was dominated by the stately manor houses of two wealthy families for the last five centuries. But Kitty's family wasn't one. Being working class, as far back as anyone could recall, they had always lived there working as farmers and domestic servants. Kitty's life was as tough as anyone else's in that era. But with a loving mum, a hard-working dad, and being one of several brothers and sisters, she came from a good family in this tight-knit country community. When the world was first plunged into all-out war, she remained in the village, working as a maid and keeping tabs on her elderly parents. But when her brothers returned from war, Some, like Ernest, stayed and used his military training to become a mechanic and a chauffeur for one of the prominent families. But with some of her other siblings now living in the big city, Kitty wanted more for her life and moved to London. Widely regarded as reliable, pleasant and fast on her feet, Kitty worked several jobs in cafes and pubs but really found her place as a nippy. One of the infamously speedy waitresses at Maison Lyonnaise, the corner house tea room owned by J. Lyons & Co. on the corner of Edgware Road and Marble Arch. Dressed head to foot in black, with a white lace pinny, red buttons and a paper hat, Kitty worked 54 hours a week for a wage of 26 shillings. It wasn't a lot, 
but she got by. And being a nice girl, she befriended a regular customer called Mrs. Warren, who ran a lodging house at 75 Star Street. And that was Kitty. She led a simple life, as many of us do, with no real troubles, issues or stresses. She worked hard. She lived as well as her wage would allow. And she hoped, one day, to have a home, a few kids. And having been in and out of relationships, she was yet to find her Mr. Right. Harry was born, Harry Tufney, in 1898, making him two years younger than Kitty when he took his own life. Raised in Chalfont St. Peter, a village in Buckinghamshire, he also came from working-class stock. Living in a cramped hovel in the delightfully named Gravel Hill, the Tufney family was large but typical of the era with Harry being the first surviving child of Mum Alice and John, a bricklayer, followed by Florence, Lucy, William, Isabella and George in quick succession. But his childhood would be short and tragic. In 1912, aged just four, his baby brother George died in the Buckinghamshire Insane Asylum. His illness was undiagnosed, but it was reported that he had suffered from strong emotions and bouts of delusion. Three years earlier, his aunt had died in that same asylum. His younger brother William was committed there in 1920, where he would remain until his death. And being prone to hearing voices and irrational acts, one frequent inmate to the asylum was the only woman he would ever love, ever love. his beloved mum. It is unknown whether Harry was ever a patient at the asylum, but as a painfully loyal young man who took loss very personally, aged 11, Harry was found hanging from an apple tree. But no one really knew if this was an accident, bullying, or suicide. In 1916, Harry did his bit for king and country and enlisted. Trained as a motorcycle mechanic, he rose to the rank of staff sergeant in the light car patrol of the 11th Machine Gun Corps, based out of Tanta in Egypt. He had a career, a wage, a home, and a new family amongst his fellow soldiers. He was described as loyal, brave, but a little hot-headed. Years later, he would claim that, in 1918, he was hit by shrapnel in the head. There is no medical record to disprove this, and by 1934 he had no injury or scar. But that doesn't mean it didn't, happen. it didn't happen. In 1920, it was said that while attempting to quell an uprising in Tanta, and seeing one of his comrades being bashed and nearly killed by a brutal mob, in a peak of uncontrolled anger, he ran amok at the riot, shooting and stabbing three Egyptians to death. Three weeks later, to protect a military policeman who was also his pal, he shot an Egyptian boy dead. No action was taken, no report was filed, and being wartime, there was no trial or inquiry. But that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It didn't happen. On the 12th of June, 1920, he married 18-year-old Victoria Marderos. They moved into a little flat in Tanta, and being demobbed from the army, he found a new career as the chauffeur, bodyguard and motor mechanic to an unnamed Egyptian prince. To his highness, Harry was and would always remain his eternally loyal servant. 
but always believing the Victoria, his wife, who he later described as an obnoxious woman whose conduct preyed on my mind, was unfaithful. Six years later, Harry divorced her, but not before he had tried to shoot her dead. That summer, his mother died in the Buckinghamshire Insane Asylum, being broken distraught at her passing. He tried to find love again, but by 1932, his second wife, Margaret, had also died, just weeks after they were married. In Harry's eyes, he had been abandoned again and again and again. Love had eluded him. Happiness was a distant memory, and he would be forever cursed to live his life alone. That is until September 1933, when Harry met Kitty. With Harry a mechanic and Kitty a waitress, unable to afford swanky dinners and champagne, their romance was like anyone else's, simple and sweet. They went to pubs, to cinemas, and took long walks in the park, eating cheese and pickle sandwiches wrapped in wax paper and feeding the crusts to the ducks. They held hands in public, they kissed in the dark of the cinema, and they went to dances as an excuse to hold each other tight. By Christmas 1933, after four months together, Harry proposed and Kitty accepted. Taking up Mrs. Warren's very kind offer, by the April, Harry and Kitty had rented two adjoining rooms at the lodging house at 75 Star Street. It was pleasant, clean, quiet, and full of ten lodgers in full-time employment. Harry and Kitty's rooms were small but affordable, with each consisting of a single bed, an armchair, a washstand, a small fireplace for heating, and for hot water, a small hob connected to a gas tap at the skirting board. Being a temporary fix until they could afford a place of their own, it was filled with the typical things. Some hats, some coats, some shoes, his bits for shaving, her bobs for makeup, and a few pieces to make a nice nighttime brew. As well as being sparsely decorated with a few family keepsakes, their many love letters, and on their bedside tables, a photo of each other. There was no denying that Harry was entirely devoted to Kitty. Only Kitty was not as devoted to Harry and it plagued on his mind. Like many relationships, once the honeymoon period was over, feelings were never as strong. It didn't mean she didn't love him. She did. She just didn't love him as much. But as another loving relationship seemed to slip through his fingers, his lifelong fear of abandonment rose once again. Over the next few weeks, still living in adjoining rooms as they could afford little else. They remained together, but had clearly drifted apart. In one of several letters written to his sister Lucy, Harry wrote of his pain and his anguish, stating, There's something wrong with my brain. One day, I feel like something is going to snap. In May 1934, after a decade of loyal service and just four weeks before he did the unthinkable, 
Harry lost his job as chauffeur and mechanic to the Egyptian prince. On Friday the 15th of June 1934, just two weeks before, Kitty sat Harry down and told him the truth. Harry, Harry, it's it's over. over. She said it softly. She held his hand. And to make him not feel like a failure, as she knew he would, she used every possible platitude to ease his pain. You've done nothing wrong. It's not you, it's me. It wasn't meant to be. All of which he seemed to take rather well. Two days later, having admitted to his sister that he had been snooping in Kitty's handbag, Harry found a letter from a man called Briggs addressed to Kitty, in which the two planned to run away together, and in the weeks prior he had seen her out and about with several men. And although there was no evidence to disprove this, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Friday the 29th of June 1934 began as a very ordinary day. Still living in adjoined rooms and staying on friendly terms, Harry joined Kitty for a breakfast of tea, toast and boiled eggs. With her uniform crisp and neat, Kitty went to work at Maison Lyonnaise, just a few streets away. The day was bright and sunny. But for Harry, the morning was already beset by a persistent gloom. In her fireplace, he had spotted the charred remnants of yet another letter from Kitty to Briggs. I felt a blackness coming over me. I felt infuriated. I went for a walk to feel better. Skulking four streets south. Six minutes later, he arrived at an ironmonger's on Kendall Street and purchased an axe. It just came into me head. Go out, buy a chopper. With its wooden handle one foot long and the six-inch wide steel blade half a kilo in weight, as a very common tool for any household with a fireplace, It was light enough to carry in his hand, but heavy enough to split a large log in half. Returning home, I saw the letter again. I had an itching feeling all over my body, and I could see rings coming at me. I seemed to go very peculiar. Mid-afternoon, Kitty came home. He would later claim, We kissed as usual. I felt better, and I forgot all about the axe. That night, dressed in just pyjamas and a nightdress, they sat on Harry's bed, talking of their past and their future. Of one together, and one apart. As their calm and amicable conversation stretched into the wee small hours, waking no one in the whole house. With work the next morning, although lipstick would prove that the two had sipped whiskey from two tumblers, no alcohol was detected in Kitty's system. She wasn't much of a drinker, In fact, she wasn't ever morose or maudlin. She didn't have dark thoughts or depression. And she never talked of suicide. After an eighth of a bottle of whiskey, I went to her room to say goodnight. She said she was fed up, and I suggested that we should gas ourselves. We sat on the bed, and after drinking more whiskey... She started to write a letter. Although, if this was true, her suicide note 
was never found. Through his eyes, unable to face a future where this lovesick twosome could never lie side by side, together they had decided on the death pact. But through her eyes, she was just tired and headed to bed. I remember seeing it under the bed. I picked up the chopper, and after that, I went blank. With Kitty tucked up in her own little bed, snuggled under the softness of her own sheets, Harry kissed his beloved's cheek. Goodbye, my sweet. And with one swift strike, he buried the axe's blade deep into the back of her head. Splintering her skull, splitting it wide, and exposing her brains, as a thick pool of red goo formed around her lifeless corpse, as her last ever breath slowly left her cooling body. With Kitty gone, Harry used his last moments alive to write one letter to the police and one to his family, apologizing for what he had done and was yet to do. Dear Mum and all, my darling passed away at 3am. It was instantaneous. She did not suffer at all, never murmured. We had quite a long chat together. We had a bottle of ale and a small bottle of whiskey. A parting drink from this world to the next. She said she did not care which way things went. Little did she know how near both our times were. Goodbye all, Harry. With Kitty's handwritten love letters to Briggs strewn about the floor, and their last drink still wetted with her lipstick, Harry laid upon the carpet. Placing down cushions for his head, he laid flat and opened the gas taps. Through Harry's eyes, death was the only option. Her death. His death. Together. Only Harry didn't die. Why? We don't know. Maybe a window was open. Maybe the gas was weak. Or maybe it was all a lie. The police arrived at 75 Star Street at 9.14am to find a body, an axe, two tumblers, two letters written by Harry, no letters written by Kitty or Briggs, no witnesses, no assault, no signs of a struggle. And following a medical, the police surgeon confirmed that Harry was suffering from coal gas poisoning. Harry was charged at 11.30am with her murder, to which he confessed... I murdered the girl, and that is the end of it. I've done it. I have had my revenge. While on remand at Brixton Prison, two medical specialists came to two different conclusions. Dr. Organ for the defence stated that Harry was temporarily insane at the time of the murder and had a family history of insanity, whereas Dr. Grierson for the prosecution refuted this, stating that Harry was sane. Tried at the Old Bailey, Harry pleaded guilty to manslaughter by reasons of insanity. But having already made a full confession to the police, the jury found him guilty and he was sentenced to death. But was any of this Harry's fault? With his mother, his aunt and two younger brothers dead, having been hung as a child, injured as a soldier and having shot and stabbed four Egyptians to protect his friends. With a divorced first wife, a dead second wife and now a dead future third wife, all of whom he said had cheated on him. Would Harry have committed this heinous act if they hadn't abandoned him? 
all of this is entirely true. But only if you see it through Harry's eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. As always, if you enjoy a bit of non-obligatory chinwaggery, featuring a cup of tea, a possible cake, diet permitting, a little quiz, and a few extra details about this case, please do join us after the break. A big thank you to my new Patreon supporters, who are Nicola Marshall, Darren Gallagher, Caroline Wilshire, Matthew Miskell, and Sarah Bevan. I thank you for supporting the show, my belly, my cholesterol count, and any shares in the Mr. Kipling Bakery. I thank you. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. <sighs> of course I say sleep well, but you might be... You might be listening to this whilst whilst uh, awake, or I hope you're listening to this while you're awake, or you might be listening to this while driving a car. So I certainly hope that you don't sleep well, because I don't want to be responsible for anyone's death, uh, unless they die in Soho, and it's funny. Oh. Hello, everyone. How are you all? You're, well, you're good and well and happy, and uh, everyone doing good? Yeah, good. That's good news. I think, it's, I think we all need bit of joy and fun in our life and even though we might be listening to true crime and a lot of it's depressing I, I guess in a kind of a weird way we can take away from this and say you know what when you look at when you look at how depressing some people's lives are in a lot of these true crime stories you can kind of say to yourself well do you know what in comparison my life's not that bad is it it's like it's like if a, if a big woe of the day is you couldn't buy something that you wanted to or you can't afford to buy something this week but you hope to in the future it's not a real problem is it it's like so that's that um anyway welcome to extra mile as always this is the the, the non-essential uh unscripted bit as mentioned we'll do a quiz in a bit there'll be some extra details about this case that i can dive into uh but it's mostly just waffle so if you're not a fan of the waffle switch off now not a problem at all um i'm going to do my usual i'm going to put on the water and make a cup of tea and open up some windows and doors uh and then uh windows open here we go here we go uh probably hear the sounds of ducks outside kettle on uh tea over here what should i do should i do a tea i'll do a tea tea bag in uh yorkshire tea uh this will be two sugars thank you very much even though i'm meant to be on a diet oh, i could bear balls to it i lost a bit of weight you don't need to you don't need to lose too much weight i think i think sometimes it's not especially with winter coming it's not so much being fat i like to consider it as uh getting my ready myself ready to hibernate for the winter and i think you need a good layer of fat on you to protect you so um if we get a strong winter this year uh, all the skinny people will will be killed off, and all all of those of us who've got a bit of a chunkage on us will survive. Oh dear! There we go. I'm back. Uh, what else is going on? It's a nice sunny day. I think we've 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 had three days of summer this year, which I don't mind. I don't like heat. I'm not a heat person. I'm a cold person. I like cold weather. I like wind. I like rain. I don't like heat. Nothing you can do about heat. Cold, you can put on extra layers. Wet, you can put on waterproof. Hot. All you can do is strip down. You can only get down so far and then you start burning. I don't like that. So heat wave, especially living in a steel boat, it can get, it's like hot days outside when it's 32 inside, it can be close to 50. It's like sweltering hot. And especially when you're recording, you've got to have the windows shut. So it's a real pain in the ass. What else is going on? Uh, I'm currently re-editing all the old episodes of Murder Mile, but just because the sound was too good i had an old laptop i had an old uh microphone i had a different bit of kit different earphones and when i was re-listening to them the other day the sound wasn't great and it was really painfully quiet and some people had said oh i didn't realize there were sounds and music in the early episodes and there is so i'm going through all those now i've just as we speak i've just done up to episode 16 so 
Uh, all the original episodes have been redone. Uh, they all sound a lot better as well. They've all been bumped up a bit so you can hear them properly. I'm going to burn through and do them all. And the idea is to... The later ones are all better episodes, so they've all got better quality sound. I'll burn through them all. I'll make all the sound good. I'll go through all the extra miles as well, because uh, some of the extra miles aren't as loud as they should be, so I'll bump up all the sound on that. And the bits when I go and make a cup of tea, I'll, in the later episodes, I've bumped up the sound on that anyway, so you can hear that more. So hopefully, by the end of this year, all everything should be... Uh, on part and then in the new year i've made a note to myself i'm going to try and re-record all of the really early episodes because the sound is just awful oh so that might be january sorted when i was going to take some time off but i i, I really want to get this done what else is going on gearing up for crime con which uh, as we speak is in, in about two weeks time looking forward to that so uh, me uh paul from uh uk true crime uh no uh, uh true crime enthusiast sorry paul uh adam from uk true crime are doing rippers so that'll be good fun we've never done that before so that'll be good fun and i'm also doing a live version of a classic murder mile episode i was re-editing it the other day and i was having a good old giggle with it and i know what i'm going to do uh, with the episode so yeah, i'm going to make it a bit more fun and it'll just so if if you're at crime con please do come and see me we'll have a bit of a, a giggle that'd be good fun uh what else is going on my water's about to go not it makes me sound like i'm pregnant i'm not pregnant although i do look it uh let me just pop that in now and then we'll do the quiz pop that in let that brew oh that's all good that's it no cake today uh, although in front of me i do have uh, a very lovely knitted bakewell tart which uh, sue gave me on the tour uh, last weekend as of when we speak which is great so that's uh, there's some lovely murder mile merch in front of me i've got uh, non-official merch i've got uh, a murder mile plant pot which has never gone outside because i think it's too pretty so it stayed inside my murder mile police book uh, murder mile uh bakewell tart i've still got the the, the tins of stroop waffles they they the tins came in very handy but i ate the waffles too quick oh, like a big piggy uh what else is going on uh oh pcag police constable arsenal guinness is coming over today unfortunately the the new blue recordings that we did in soho didn't turn uh, they sounded all right but when i double checked them there was there was uh, uh, issues with the sound so uh, i i mentioned it to pcag and he very kindly has said don't worry about that we'll do it again so he's coming he's traveling all the way out to my boat we're going to sit on the boat on this hot day uh, and we're going to re-record them on the boat pretending that we haven't already done them uh, which would be good so uh, thanks to pcag for that poor guy he's doing doing night shift last night la last night and then he's going to finish the night shift then come here then come up he's like i don't know how he does it anyway it, it, the 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 rough versions that we did were really interesting do you know we had th some really good conversations so it turned out well we're going to do it again but the sound will be better we we were just like if if we're going to do it the sound has to be perfect it was nice having the sound of people in the pub behind us but it was just it was distracting and someone near us had an old phone and it kept going you know when you can hear it on recordings it's it's just it was really annoying i'm just getting my tea so yeah we're going to redo it on the boat uh uh come on tea bag oh hot 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 uh pop that in there there we go wow wowee there we go oh, oh i had an itchy nose all morning and i don't know why itchy nose and in front of me i got a little crunchy oh chuck uh, honeycomb chocolate uh honeycomb wrapped in a chocolate lovely brilliant i'm gonna have that right let's do a quiz everyone Oh, don't forget i may balls this up when we go into the extra stuff afterwards so i apologize for that but i but um this section is unedited so i will not change it even if i uh, edited it it just happens if i if i balls it up you get that point that's all good so 10 questions here's question number one what was kitty's full name uh that's quite a difficult one actually uh question two what restaurant did she work at bonus point who have we uh mentioned previously who was a customer at that restaurant Ooh, there's two people in fact 
Uh, question three. What Egyptian city was Harry posted to during the war? Question four. Who was the owner of the lodging house at 75 Star Street? Question five. What army unit was Harry in? That's not even a good sentence, but you get it. Question six. What was his rank? Question seven. What was one of uh, what was one of Harry's first jobs as a boy? Question eight. Harry killed Kitty with an axe, but what word did he use to describe it? Question nine. Uh, what did he what did Harry put under his head before gassing himself? And question ten. What two drinks did Harry and Kitty supposedly drink that night? Supposedly drink that night. Uh, so let's dive in this while I'm looking at that crunchy. That crunchy just looks great. I'm sure it's diet free. Diet free? Yeah, of course. That's uh, let's let's say that from now on. Anything anything that's not clearly not a diet product, we'll refer to it as diet free. Because that way, that way, at least, at least you go. I, I'm eating this because it's diet free, and it sounds like it's a diet product, but it's clearly not because it's diet free. That's the way I'll describe things from now on. My diet free crunchy. It makes you feel better. So uh, we'll just dive into some details about Harry's life. So he was born in. Check that I am not going to balls this up. That's not a question. Okay, he was uh, living in Gravel Hill in Chalfont St Peter. His father, John, was about age 40. In 1941, he was a bricklayer. His mother, Alice Tufney, born in 1870, was from Forfar in Scotland. Uh, can't say what. Harry went to school. He left at 14, which was about average age. Uh, sisters, Florence, Lucy, William. Obviously, William is a brother. Isabella, uh, all born in Chalfont St Peter, and George was their uh, youngest brother who was four years old and he died in the Buckinghamshire Mental Asylum, uh, which is a St John's Hospital near a near Aylesbury. That's where what it currently is now. Uh, as mentioned, there was a long history of insanity in the family, so his, uh, his mother was an inmate at the same institution. She'd been there many years ago. Um, she went in there permanently in 1926, um, sorry, uh, she died there in uh, 1928, but she'd been there for a couple of years prior to that. She was 58 years old. His brother William had been in the same home since 1920. George, his younger brother, died in 1916 in the same home. It, it was never diagnosed exactly what they had, but it, se it seems to be on both sides. So the aunt was his father's sister. She went into the, the, the insane asylum uh, in 1910. Uh, and there's a lot going on. So one year after that, um, uh, double check I'm not doing the questions. Yes, that's fine. Uh, see, I'm being good. I'm double checking. Well done, Michael. Well done. Uh, it is said that when he 11 years old, so the year after his aunt died, um, I wonder if something happened to his mum that year as well. So maybe with the aunt dying, maybe the mum Something happened to his mum as well, which is why he went a little bit la la. Uh, Eleven years old, he apparently he hung himself, but uh, it was unsure whether there were some boys seen nearby, so they're unsure whether he was being bullied at the time or whatnot. Uh, what else did we get? So uh, he was eighteen years old apparently when he enlisted, but we we think that he may have enlisted earlier. He may have been sixteen. The the. Uh, in 1912, um, it was quite common for kind of boys to kind of enlist when when they weren't allowed to. You were meant to be 16 years old, but there is proof that there was a guy called Sidney Lewis who said he was 17 years old. He was fighting in the Battle of Somme, but he was only 12 years old. People would just fake their name because it was a bit of an adventure. Uh, he went off and did that. Uh, he definitely went to war. I won't say uh, what. Uh, is this a question? Yes, it's a question, so I won't do that one. Uh, we know he went to Egypt. We know what battalion he was in. We know what his rank was. All of this is kind of listed. We know that when he came out, he was given... He was awarded the 1914 Star, the British War Medal and the Victor Victory Medal, uh, which all serving soldiers would have got anyway. Uh, no other awards after that. 
Ah, uh, what else did we get? We don't really know much about the the uprising. So I've tried to put everything in there that I could find, but there's very little written about it. Don't forget it's wartime, so not there's no, not really a lot that kind of, you know, people being shot and things like that was a daily event. So who really, especially they would see the Egyptians as kind of overseas, who cares, you know, not British, not worth thinking about. Therefore, the, no names are ever really mentioned. Uh, but it seems to be... It seems to be uncertain whether he just went a little bit loopy or whether he was protecting his friends. And that's what he said. Uh, he said that, you know, uh, he had seen uh, some of his friends being bashed up, as he said, and one of them nearly killed. So he ran amok at a riot, which was what they said. He shot and stabbed and killed three Egyptians during an uprising. Obviously, an uprising is a bit of a euphemism for riot, but it could just mean, you know, a bit of a protest or some people throwing stones it's a bit vague it really is uh and he also said that he came to the rescue of a military policeman who was a friend of his and therefore he shot and killed an egyptian boy we don't know what age the egyptian boy was but again this was he uh, he saw his friend being bashed up uh what else do we have we don't really know much about the egyptian prince unfortunately there's some details in there uh i got hold of the police file ages ago and i got most of the details from that but unfortunately um there was another file and i couldn't get to that one i think that's where all the details about the prince were so uh unfortunately we don't know much about him we i mean it, it, it probably is true there seems to be a lot of people who kind of knew about the prince but we don't really know what much went on uh the relationship um it, when harry was questioned later on he uh, he had a crunchy. Mm, 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 mm. I broke. I broke too early. Oh God, that's good. Um, mm, 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 mm. so sweet. Um, sweet. Um, when Harry was questioned by the police later on, he said, he said that he and uh, his girlfriend at the time, Kitty, argued a lot, which they didn't. He said that she was drunk at the time, which she wasn't. There was no hint of alcohol in their autopsy. To be honest, the way that they checked was by smelling her breath. There was no real alcohol test at that point. So, do you know, how much alcohol was in her system, we don't really know. Um, they were engaged. We don't know whether they had a ring. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any letters. We only found the letters of uh, the ones that Harry wrote. There were no other letters. We don't know who this man, Briggs, is. Uh, it was believed it was a gentleman called Sidney Briggs, but we don't know much else about that, unfortunately. So it's, it's that that case is a bit of a mystery, although it could be in the other archive file, which I couldn't get my hands on at the time. Unfortunately, it was unavailable, which was a real pain in the ass. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, yeah, so that letter that Harry left. Uh, the one, so he starts, Dear Mum and All which is an odd letter to write when you consider the fact that his mum died six years ago and many of his brothers were already dead and we don't know where his dad was at uh, that point. He said, my darling passed away at 3am, obviously not mentioning at that point that he'd hit her in the head with an axe. It was instantaneous, which it was, according to Spilsbury. She did not suffer at all. Uh, apparently not. She was face down on the bed. There was no uh, signs of assault. She had no bruises. She didn't seem to have moved at all. She was lying face down and... Uh, he hit her uh, on the back of the head. We're not too sure whether he kissed her before or after he'd hit her over the head with the axe. Ooh, delightful. Uh, she, he said she never murmured. We had quite a long chat together. We had a bottle of ale and a small bottle of whiskey, which um, apparently mostly he drank. A parting drink from this world into the next. At 1am after I talk over things, she said that she did not seem to care which way things went, which is bollocks because uh, clearly he's thinking about suicide and she's just thinking about going to bed because she's got work in the morning little did she know how near both our life both our times were mm. now it is four o'clock i must kiss her finally darling uh uh goodbye all harry so that was the one letter the other letter he wrote one to the police as well just kind of explaining what what was going on but it was all kind of bullshit another one that was found was to his sister isabel who was one of his sisters uh it said i'm very sorry if i have caused you trouble but as things are but as things are this is the only way 
I am not insane, which is an interesting thing to write in a letter. Uh, I owed her. Now, there's a woman's name that was kind of mentioned, uh, but we don't know what it was, on an account. So this is something to do with uh, why he was sacked. She wrote a nasty letter to His Highness about me. His Royal Highness was very annoyed and put me out of employment. You have heard me talking about Kathleen, my girl, who I have dearly loved since September 1933 until today. We have decided to get married, but a fortnight ago she said that she was going to leave me. Uh, in her room I noticed a letter. Nosy Parker, I opened it and read this letter. Mm. So there we go. Uh, what else we got? Diving through. His suicide is weird. It's like, uh, we don't really know why. So the doctor actually says, yes, he was suffering from gas coal poisoning. It was 1934, so... Uh, this was before the point that they started putting sulphur in the gas because people were using the gas rings. So at the, at the base of your floor would be the gas pipe going around and then you could connect things up to it like a stove or anything like that using a bit of rubber hose. It wasn't, it wasn't particularly safe. Uh, some of them would go up and you would use them as lighting as well. So that's why they were in place. Uh, but what some people would do, like, like if you go out to the Reg Christie episode, he would attach a rubber hose to it and with... Um, some of his victims, he'd, he'd connect it up to a mask. Uh, but in this case, Harry... And what some people do is, did a suicide, they would just stick their head next to the gas pat, tap. This was in an era before when they started putting sulphur into the gas. So if you were to try and gas yourself today, you couldn't do it. You would just be sick first. And that's because they deliberately put sulphur in it to make you sick before you've ingested enough gas to kill yourself. But in this era, it was pre-sulphur. Uh, so Harry was lying on the floor uh, oh I almost spoiled something then I didn't well done Michael um, he put his head next to the, next to the gas tap he switched it on um, it, do, it doesn't, doesn't seem to have happened he, he's got gas coal poisoning he doesn't seem he would have drifted off into unconsciousness but he didn't so whether the room was too big whether he'd left a window open no one else seemed to have smelt gas in the house so maybe he just gave up, or maybe he just made it look like he tried to kill himself to, to go for some kind of insanity plea. Uh, he went to the uh, Marleybone Lane Police Station, which is at, if I remember, it's 51 Welbeck Street, on the corner of Marleybone Lane. Uh, I'll take a picture and I'll put... I, if you go to uh, if you're a patron subscriber, you get all the pictures anyway, so you can have a look on there. It's still there today. It's It's now a Pret typical where everyone goes in to buy bloody avocado and crayfish sandwiches uh but yeah he walked in and he said i have killed my girl here is the key to the bedroom door and he handed over the key um it doesn't no one really says much about how whether he was emotional at the time or whether he was angry he just seems to have been, been a bit bit near i did it maybe he was just tired or maybe he was suffering from uh coal gas poisoning uh, police arrived at 9.14am and they saw Edith in the bed they said blood was everywhere the bed was saturated with blood she was lying face down and underneath the bed was the the uh, the axe uh, Divisional Detective Inspector Burt who was in charge of the investigation said I am Police, in I am police Inspector Detective Burt one day PCAG you'll be able to say Police Inspector uh, uh, and I'm going to charge you with the murder of uh, 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 her full name between the 29th and 30th of June at 75 Star, Star Street Paddington by striking her in the head with that mm, one of the answers to the questions Harry was cautioned but made no reply uh, uh, but admitted there is a complete list in there in a letter of why I done it uh, unfortunately, we don't have that letter. I would love to have that letter. But he did say later on, uh, he admitted uh, that he had killed her because she was going to run away with uh, with her, her, her new boyfriend, so she said. Uh, the inquest was held by uh, Mr. Ingleby Oddy, uh, the Paddington coroner. Uh, the body was identified by Ernest, who was, uh, Kath, who was Kitty's uh, brother. Sir Bernard Spilsbury, he wasn't Sir Bernard at that point, he was, I believe he was just Dr Spilsbury, uh, conducted the autopsy, as always, each autopsy starts with the, she was a well-nourished woman, I just hate that, what's, what's the point? 
Uh, if someone's well nourished, why say it? Why, why, why put it in there? Why, do, why not? If if there's a problem with their weight or something like that, then point it out if it's important. If they're well nourished, why, why bother to mention it? Maybe it's just tradition. Maybe they have to do it. He said uh, the scalp had been split for a distance of about four inches on the left hand side, and the skull was split open. There was a good deal of blood about the head. The blade had penetrated the skull deeply, and the cause of death was injury to the brain consistent with a blow from a hatchet. There was no smell of alcohol. The brain was exposed. Otherwise, she was a perfectly healthy woman with no diseases, and there was no sign that she had defended herself. Uh, he looked at the axe, and he said it would, that was the exact right axe, the right weight to have done the injuries. Um, was... Harry insane this is what the trial was diving into so uh, Dr George Douglas Organ good name of Harley Street who was a specialist in nervous diseases was consulted by the defense and thought that Harry was far from sane uh, but said that it was likely that he was temporarily insane at the time of the murder and said that he had a long history of, fa of mental illness in the family. Uh, whereas Dr. Grierson, who was the medical officer for Brixton Prison, where George was being, uh, George, where Harry was being held under, uh, was being held prior to his trial, stated that he could find no evidence of insanity. Unfortunately, this happens a lot when you've got prosecution and defence, you know, they... The, the prosecution will find someone who will prove what they want. The defense will find someone who will prove something. It's like when you watch any documentary and there's, there's a pathologist on it. And the pathologist goes, goes, oh, I think it's definitely a murder. And then everyone watching it goes, oh, well, it was definitely a murder because the pathologist said it. But you can give the same pieces of evidence to 10 different pathologists and they will come up with slightly different opinions. It's not, it's unless it's clear cut, it's not hard fact. It's, it's, it's like archaeology, do you know? Sometimes with archaeology, archaeologists admit this, they can only go by the information they've got. And sometimes it, it might not be 100% accurate, but, do you know, they can hypothesise. And unfortunately, and as we've seen, do you know, we've, we've seen with the, the Camden Ripper, you can have good pathologists and you can have dog shit pathologists who can just make up any old shit whenever they want. And they're just dreadful. Uh, hence, murder investigations can collapse. So, do you know just because something on telly and uh, you know someone has a title doesn't mean you should believe them at all uh, this uh this one this seems to be a nice simple case though uh, so the trial uh was initially uh uh well uh there was the initial inquest at uh obviously paddington uh coroner's court and then um harry was appeared on the 7th of july at marleybone police court uh, basically, he just had to turn up there. Uh, the, he stood in the dock, holding his hand in, holding his hat in one hand and his overcoat over the other. Uh, this is before. Uh, initially, he did not request a solicitor, but Mr. Snell, who was in in charge of the uh, um, the, the initial court trial, I've forgotten the name of it. It's gone out of my head at the moment. Uh, Mr. Snell asked uh, if he was going to be represented harry said no it is done and was done by this hand so again in the pre-trial he was there saying i definitely did it and it was these hands that did it uh by the time he, he was tried at the old bailey this time he got a defense team um he pleaded not guilty to murder and they opted for a defense of guilty of manslaughter by reasons of insanity obviously because he'd already confessed to the police and multiple people several times um he was defended by uh, Derek Cur Curtis Bennett uh, and Eustace Fulton, uh, w Fulton was for the prosecution. There you go. You've got to have uh, posh and fancy names if you if you want to be uh, a lawyer. Uh, Harry's letters and confession was used as evidence to help the jury decide if he was sane or insane at the time of the murder. The jury found him guilty in just 20 minutes. Uh, Justice Atkinson said it was a very bu brutal murder and passed a sentence of death. Uh, interesting because uh, nothing was stolen. Uh, so technically, really, it should have been a life sentence or he should have been committed to an asylum if he was found insane at the time. But he wasn't. He was executed. Our kind of uh, capital punishment uh, seems to be a bit flaky because it's meant to be you st if you kill someone and you steal something it's a death sentence if you kill someone it's a life sentence but it seems to be a bit a bit flaky at times uh there was a petition 
on the 21st of September 1934 uh, for him to be uh, to have his sentence commuted. Uh, but unfortunately, the the appeal uh, failed, uh, even though it had been presented the, to the Home Secretary. He was executed at Pentonville Prison on the 9th of October 1934 at 9am by Robert Baxter. Whoa, that was that. I think I deserve... Mmm. Mmm. Mmm, that's good. Mmm, with a cup of tea as well. Mm. Oh, yeah. Mmm. Mm. I hope no one's listening to this on a big speaker because it sounds like an, I'm having an organism. <laughs> anyway. Oh, that's nice. You can't beat a bit of a, a bit of honeycomb. Honeycomb and chocolate. Great. Right, let's do the quiz. Let's do the answers. So... Uh, last week you would have noticed that I forgot to do the answers. This week I haven't forgot to do the answers. Uh, quiz, quiz. Of course it's a quiz. Michael, what's going on? Uh, question one. Um, what was Kitty's full name? I'll give you a point if you got her first name. Uh, her full name was uh, Edith Kathleen Longshaw. Question two. What restaurant did she work at? It was Maison Lyonnaise. Uh, I think that's at Cumberland House at the moment. Uh, uh, as a bonus question, um, uh, you can have one or the other. Which two people mentioned previously in Murder Mile uh, were customers at Maison Lyonnaise? It was the Blackout Ripper, Gordon Frederick Cummings, and Evelyn Hamilton, his first victim, as apparently that's where he picked her up. Um... And I think it's, it's it's appeared a couple of times. Maison Lyonnaise has appeared in the, the series a couple of times. Um, question three. What Egyptian city was Harry posted to? It was Tanta. Question four. Who was the owner of the lodging house at 75 Star Street? It was Elizabeth Warren. Um, unlike mo most women at that time, they weren't allowed to own property. But because she was a widow, therefore she could. Uh, question five. What army unit was Harry in? Good question. Badly written. Uh, it was the light car patrol of the 11th Machine Gun Corps. Uh, so those were the uh, those were the guys who uh, you've got a, uh, a motorbike and then a sidecar. And in the sidecar was like a little machine gun. He was he was part of that group and he was a mechanic. And question number six. What was his rank? He was staff sergeant. Question seven. What was one of Harry's first jobs as a boy? Good luck if you got this one. This one was snuck in a sentence. Uh, he was a part-time baker's boy. Question eight. Harry killed Kitty with an axe. But what word did he use to describe it? Or what word did he use to call it? It was a chopper. Question nine. What did he put under his head before gassing himself? It was two cushions. And question ten. What two drinks did Kitty and Harry supposedly drink that night? It was whiskey and ale. So there we go. There we go, people. That was that. Hope you enjoyed that. That was all good fun. We've got, a, a, I think it's another single episode next week, which would be nice. Uh, number two, da, da, yeah, and then and then we got, and then we've got a two-parter. And then we do New Blue, uh, which is the three-parter that we'll do with Police Constable Arsenal Guinness. Uh, and then there'll be a run of eight episodes to take us through to the end of the year. And then I can have some time off. Time off, lovely. So this is now the weird bit of the show where I, I ramble and ramble and ramble and try and find a way to end this. And then I press stop. And then it's really weird because I've been talking and talking and talking for hours now. Literally hours to do the recording and all this bit. And then it stops. And all of a sudden it's just silence. It's really weird. And then I'm all, I realise I'm all alone. 
except Eva's obviously in the bedroom calling out for cocktails and me to make make her her lunch. Oh dear, or, or probably knowing her a hangover breakfast. Pissed. Anyway, that's uh, Murder Mile. Hope you enjoyed that. Have yourself a good week. Stay safe. Be good. Lots of love. Bye bye.